Alrighty guys, thanks for joining me. This is your host ID Jester. We're going to be looking at lock and load, specifically um, the um, uh, lock and load tactical core system to be exact, as they have released uh, version 5 of the rules. And so Lock and Load is a system, a squad-based tactical system uh, that you can purchase from Lock and Load Publishing, as you can see right there, www.lnlpublishing.com. Highly, highly recommend you check that uh, website out if you're interested in some awesome uh, tactical gaming and, uh, yeah. Pokey Trey, what's going on, my friend? Thanks for joining me. Appreciate it. Hope all is well with you tonight. We're going to be going over Heroes of Normandy and the Lock and Load Tactical System. Uh, we're going to be uh, going over that, as I mentioned, because um, they've released version 5. So they kind of had like a modern version of the rules, and they had like a World War II version of the rules. And now they, what they've done is kind of combine them into one core set of rule books. So that way all the rules are in one rule book that you can um, reference and uh, kind of fine tune the rules a little bit and uh, really kind of um, uh, streamlined it and, uh, you know, kind of updated it to, uh, to version five. So, we're going to be looking at that. Actually, uh, there is, as you can see here, a uh, lock and load computer program that had come out quite a few years ago. I'm thinking probably 2011, 2012, maybe-ish. Um, they don't they don't even sell this anymore. I don't think you can even get this. Mark H. Walker's Lock and Load Heroes of Stalingrad. I think it's been discontinued on the Slytherin slash matrix games website um and when i went to the lock and load publishing website I, I didn't see it anywhere so i don't think you can actually buy this anymore but this basically has the um the lock and load system and of course you can play different games and it's got an editor and i've done a bunch of videos on this actually um a while back it's been probably a couple years ago I did some videos on the lock and load and how to create scenarios and and uh, you know play different scenarios on it lock and load system is one of my favorite um, one of my favorite tactical war game systems out there it's pretty in-depth but it's very easy to get into it's my philosophy. I'm a big squad-based guy anyways, as everyone on my channel knows. I could definitely um, I could definitely prefer squad-based squad based, um, combat as opposed to uh, like strategic combat. Viper Dave, hey man, what's going on? Viper Dave says, hi, I like this game and have the computer version. Nobody's ever played it online. <laughs> I just actually just loaded that up to show people that uh, there was actually a computer game uh, back in the day. Mark H. Walker's Lock and Load Heroes of Stalingrad. I did some videos. I did some um, tutorial videos on how to create scenarios and using the editor. And I think I even played a couple scenarios back in the day. Um, and I might actually uh, bring uh, bring that back out of the archives and play a uh a game or two on the program but today we're going to be looking at version 5.0 of the rule book so they just released um, kind of recently the lock and load tactical core rules and you see it covers it covers all different kind of wars whether you're talking about world war ii you're talking about uh, modern day combat uh, the system is designed for anything in between that and they have all kinds of different modules you can pick up for any of your interests whether it's east front west front 
uh, Pacific, uh, if we're talking World War II. Um, they have modern day uh, combat in Afghanistan. They got Vietnam. They got lots of different modules, so highly recommend you check it out. But anyways, we're going to be going through the core rule set and trying to teach, trying to teach some of it um, to those people out there that are unfamiliar with the system. Kind of just go over a few things here. Uh, specifically, we're going to be going over like chapter one and two, which is kind of the meat of everything, where you kind of learn the basics. And for this, we're going to be using, actually, we're going to be using the uh, lock and load module uh, that you can use inside of Vassal. So yes, you can play this in Vassal uh, if you uh, have purchased the game. And we're going to be just going covering, covering like I said, we're not going to go into too much details in this first episode. I don't, I'm not sure how long we're going to, this live stream will go. But uh, the longer it goes, obviously, the more we are going to cover. So uh, hopefully, yeah, uh, Viper Day still has his uh, computer version of his game as well. Yeah, uh, I think it was really good back in the day. And there's nothing wrong with it even today. Um, it's just, uh, uh, you know, it's it has built-in AI for you. So you can play, obviously, against a computer and... Uh, the animations and everything are pretty nice. So uh, lock and load. Uh, so let's talk about lock and load generally. Um, so what's what separates lock and load from a lot of the other tactical squad level games out there? What makes it different? What makes it uh, shine? What what um, you know? What makes it different than other systems out there you know well, how can we compare this to other ones i guess there's a couple main things that i think um makes this game stand out as to other games um so i'll show you uh a uh, let's see if i can find it here without wasting too much time uh, do, 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 do. Where the heck is it? All right, come on. Uh, if you download the, the actual uh, rules, which you can download from the uh, Lock and Load System uh, website, you can download them for free. Uh, of course, you can buy a nice book as well. Oh my gosh, I cannot believe I can't find what I'm looking for. Isn't that always the way? Isn't that always the way? <sighs> Come on, where are you, you jerk? I guess I gotta go through slower through the rule book. I'm going too fast through it, trying to find it. And that just slows things down when you try to go too fast, right? All right. Do, 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 do. All right, I obviously didn't scroll down far enough. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, uh, if you download the rule book, which is free from their website, uh, Uzi Patrol, what's going on, my friend? What's going on? Uh, Uh, all right, so um, one of the things that separate this game from other games is there is usually, um, in this scenario, there's going to be event markers. And uh, they're going to be placed in certain locations and they're going to be activated um, either when someone gets to a certain point, um, you know, wherever the objective is on if if the like in this case uh, German activation only so if the German unit enters that hex then it activates and you're going to read a paragraph uh, and some kind of events going to happen obviously because it's an event marker uh, it can kind of adds a little bit of role-playing and suspense to the scenario because you're never sure 
you know, what, obviously the first time you play this scenario, especially, you're not sure exactly what is going to happen. Uh, there's two ways to activate these event markers. There's either by uh, the side entering the hex or the side becoming visible with that hex. Uh, and lots of different things can happen. So um, you try not to read the paragraphs ahead of time for the scenario. And uh, you place these markers on the map and then they're kind of almost like objectives. So, you know, when the German is going to activate this, we're going to read, uh, you know, advent, you know, read paragraph one, and it might, it might give the German reinforcements, or it might give the Americans reinforcements, or something might happen on the map, a building might collapse, or you know, a, a squad appears out of nowhere, type thing. So you're never sure what's going to happen. So it always builds a little bit of suspense some uh um uh kind of uh intrigue into the scenario we're just never sure obviously once you play the scenario once or twice and you've come across those event markers it kind of loses the, its luster but um you know it really builds in some suspense especially for players that haven't played the scenario so that's kind of one thing that separates lock and load from other tactical uh, squad based games uh, pokey train no I'm not going to be answering any uh, any other questions I, I'm trying to focus in doing a tutorial here man sorry um, uh, so yeah I'm not gonna I'm, I'm trying to you know keep my head focused so I'm not jumping around and everything uh, so that's one of the things I think separates uh, lock and load from other tactical systems out there um, and I guess the other thing is it's very uh, it's very simplistic system uh, it's very easy to understand what's going on and how to do things once you understand the basic concepts of the game it's a very simple system I think it's something that people can pick up and um, you know, the kind of the third thing that separates it from a lot of other systems out there is, and even though it's simplistic, it incorporates everything from, like I said, World War II up to and even including modern day. So you can have helicopter rules, you got airplane rules, you have uh, partisan rules, you have uh, uh, Viet Cong rules, all incorporated into the rule book. So, um, you know, they kind of, even though it's a very easy system, you can still, depending on your, uh, what you like and what you like to uh, cover, um, you know, whether it be modern day or Vietnam or World War II, they have modules that fit in perfectly. And once again, kind of also like the John Tiller game systems that we've been covering, once you learn the game system, because the core rules apply to everything now. Uh, so once you learn the system, you can play any kind of game in the system, whether that be Vietnam or World War II. And of course, there'll be a slight variations on some of the rules, um, but everything's pretty much done the exact same way. So that's kind of cool. I mean, a lot of games don't have that uh, capability you know, uh, from taking, uh, you know, just like, for example, Combat Commander, you don't have vehicles. You only have, you know, infantry units and support weapons. So, it, you know, nothing wrong with Combat Commander. It's a great game and a great system. It's just it doesn't incorporate all of the tactics that you could within that one gaming system. Uh, obviously, there's some restrictions on that. Uh, but lock and load doesn't have these restrictions, so it makes it very viable for players like myself who are like, oh yeah, I love infantry combat, but you know, once in a while, let's get in some, you know, some heavy weapons and some heavy tanks and stuff like that. So uh, I think I think that's kind of the core things that separate uh, John or, um, lock and load. Uh, with a lot of the other squad level systems out there. So let's get into it and start talking about it. So uh, obviously there are advantages to squad based systems and 
rules as opposed to like strategic level um, you know combat where you have to worry about supply you have to worry about you know how you get your units supplied back to your supply source and you have to worry about keeping within your headquarter range and all those uh, usually rules associated with um, strategic level combat we're talking about tactical level combat we have our own issues we have to deal with with different height levels um, you know hills and buildings and what terrain blocks line of sight which terrain degrades line of sight and issues like that so um, the uh, tactical lock and load tactical system is uh, on a hex grid of maps uh, you can have multiple maps butted up against one another each hex represents about 50 meters and each game turn represents about two to four minutes of actual game time uh, so there are uh, let's just take uh, let's just take the germans here why not so there are single man counters in this game or what they like to call smcs single man counters and we'll zoom right in here to make things a little easier for us to see. So uh, well, let's slide them over here. So single main counter, let's get rid of that. Um, so these represent like your uh, leaders, your heroes, your snipers, medics, etc., uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, et cetera. They represent like one dude that has some kind of effect on combat. And then of course we have our usual. Uh, MMCs in this game is called multi man counters. So this this counter represents multiple men, and we'll get to uh, the differences there. We have uh, also usually with squad base level uh, usually have support weapons. In this case, it's an MG34. I mean, there's uh, all kinds of different ones based upon you know the Americans here uh, actually. Um, just, I don't know if the Americans actually have any in this module. Oh, there we go. Uh, they have like the bar. Oops. Uh, bazookas, uh, flamethrowers, satchel charges, uh, and of course our famous um, bazooka there, and of course your heavy machine guns and stuff, stuff like that. Uh, we also have. So you have your uh, what they call uh, weapon teams. So this is a counter that represents a specific weapon. In this case, it's a uh, heavy uh, machine gun, and it has a crew associated with it. Hey, Al Red Sox fan, how you doing, my friend? What's going on? So Viper Day says he found out about Lock and Load Games, Forgotten Hero Vietnam, and Vassal reading an article in a computer magazine. And the story is about how you can play the games on Vassal. Oh, good to know. Va good to know. That was probably a long time ago, though, wasn't it? Probably back in the day. Um, but hello, Al. Thanks for joining us today. So, of course, you have your uh, weapon teams. This counter represents... Um, couple guys that are specifically trained in operating a specific kind of weapon in this case it's a uh, heavy machine gun of course we have all kinds of different weapons we got mortars we have uh, what else do we have here uh, anti um, tank guns of different varieties and of course, as I mentioned earlier, we of course have uh, all kinds of different actual vehicles. Uh, of course, there's a German here. We have uh, Stugs here. We have uh, uh, we have little half tracks. All kinds of different vehicles and such. We're going to talk about all these things, but I just wanted to show you, um, you know, some examples here. So. So you have your weapon teams. You have your single man counters. Uh, you have your support weapons. Of course, as I mentioned, you could have aircraft uh, in different scenarios that are going to be dropping bombs around. Of course, you know, if we were playing a modern day scenario, you might have uh, 
uh, anti-air weapons and such. So great variety in the lock and load game. Um, uh, so Bogey Trace says he was worried about it when he saw the character portraits, but this doesn't look half bad. No, they're, the art quality and everything is so much better now than it was, say, probably 10 years ago when I first started buying it. Um, back in the day, I don't know if you guys uh, purchased it way back then, but they used to have what they call the Halo board because each one of these hexes had like a little halo around it. And it really distracted from the awesome artwork on the board. And, oh, my God, it was just, it was a mess. And nobody liked the game because you couldn't get anybody to play it because it had those halo hexes is what they called it back in the day. I don't know if anybody remembers that, but that's how long ago I was uh, buying into this system. It has a lot, uh, proved a lot, says Viper Dave. Yes, I agree. Uh, he said he bought the game 9-14-2009. He still has a receipt. Oh, <laughs> that is some dedication there from Viper Dave. Awesome. All right. Uh, normally, uh, when we're talking about uh, lock and load, as I talked, it's pretty simple once you understand. Obviously, the um, complexity will go down the more you understand what's going on. But uh, you're going to be using either a single die. And notice I did not say a single dice because... Every time I say a single dice, people go, dice or two dice, not one dice. So it's a die. So you're going to be using a single die for a lot of your activities. And there will be a few times that you will actually use two dice. So everything is going to be based upon either one dice or two dice. Uh, that's, that's pretty much as easy or as simple as it gets. Uh, Jim Shannon of Sa uh, Jim Shannon of Sounds, how are you doing tonight? Thanks a lot. Uh, Viper Day says he bought the boards before the Halo boards even came out. You remember the Halo boards, Viper Dave? You remember what I'm talking about? Oh my God, they were ugly, and you couldn't get anybody to sit down and play the game because you couldn't see where the hexes were, and that those bright halos around each of the hexes were so distracting and everything. But yeah, the uh, oh Viper Day says yeah he remembers. Al Red Six fan says the uh, artwork is very nice. Um, uh, C P Cunningham says he was in and got out of lock and load. Why did you get out of it? Um, there C P Cunningham. Be interesting to find out. Uh, so anyways, let's. So when we're talking about dice, we're talking about either a single die or we're talking about two dice uh, whenever we're resolving something. All right, so let's talk about stacking uh, as us uh, war gamers are. Uh, we're going to clone and clone, and we're just going to clone a couple of this guy. Can I clone you? No, I can't actually clone you, can I? Okay, I'm going to have to pull out a another single man counter here. All right, we'll pull out this guy here, and we'll pull out this guy here. Um, uh, all right, so stacking limits in a hex are going to be this. It's going to be uh, three squads, three full squads. There are half squads in this as well. Uh, if we uh, actually pull out a half squad, you'll see a full squad is represented by two guys on a, a counter. And a half squad is represented by one guy on a counter. So this is a half squad. And I bet you I can clone this guy. So two half squads equal, equal a full squad. Um, so when you're doing stacking. So you can have three squads in a hex. And you can have... Two vehicles, so if this was also in this hex and this was also in this hex, that would be allowed. And then um, you can have up to two single man counters all stacked inside one hex. So that is a stacking limit that you can have. And of course, there are equivalents to all of this stuff. So for example, uh, a weapon team. So this, this is a weapon team here. Uh, or two half squads is equal to a full squad. So instead of a, a third squad, we could put a weapon team in there instead. Or we could uh, take out another squad. We could put two half squads in there. 
So you can see you can get quite a lot into a stack if we just hover our mouse over there. It should show us all. So two vehicles, two single man counters, and the equivalent of three squads and their equivalent. Um, so CP Cunningham said he got out of it because his support dried up. Uh, that's when uh, M. Walker was running it. Yes, uh, that's... Unfortunately, I have to uh, kind of agree with you because when it first came out and everyone was gung-ho and it was really kind of, you know, getting taking hold and such and then uh yeah some of the management and stuff uh just didn't support it as much as they should have and they weren't releasing products as fast as they would and the, like i said the when they did release the products they had issues with them a aka the halo boards and etc etc um jim says he's not familiar with this game yeah it's awesome you're gonna we're going to be going over uh, a lot, uh, and since a lot of people are just joining us, I am going to uh, show you this, guys, again, for those of you uh, who have been watching from the beginning. I uh, apologize for going over this again, but they just released the Lock and Load Tactical Core Rulebook, and this is version now 5.0 is uh, the new rule set, and they've taken all of their different systems uh world war ii vietnam modern day and they basically combined them streamlined them and put them all into one rule set you can uh check it out at uh, lock and load publishing you can actually download this for free and then you can come to my channel and learn it, about it for free i'm not going to charge any any of you uh that's how nice i am and then uh you can pick up here's a few modules and you can try it out and play it for yourself it's very, uh, very good. All right, so we went through a stacking. We went through the dice. Uh, okay, blah, blah, blah. Just looking to see. Um, all right, so let's talk about uh, let's talk about what's represented in each of the counters because obviously that is ultra, ultra important. So on a single main counter, uh, which is again like your heroes your leaders, your snipers, your medics, and et cetera, et cetera. There's about eight variety, eight different varieties of single man counters, but all of them kind of have the same thing. Up in the top right-hand corner, this seven here represents the unit's morale. And then uh, for the leaders, this uh, number one represents its uh, command range, which we'll talk about here in a minute. And uh, then underneath that is its movement points. So it's a 716. And normally, whenever you refer to anything inside a lock, the lock and load system, you basically just call it by its, um, its stats. So I have a 716 leader is what you would say. Or I got a 154 half squad. Or I got a 264 full squad. Um, so you just kind of use the numbers to kind of uh talk about it so that's what i'm going to do um cb cunningham says i kind of want to get back into it now with the new lock and load yes i would highly highly recommend you get back into it now because they have got uh it's probably been and i'll be honest it's probably been about a year since i've even looked at anything lock and loaded but man when i went to that site there is so much new stuff coming out I just put my name on like everything like let me know about this let me know about this you can get on there like their free email list and everything and every time there's an update or some things are in back order when it comes in they'll email you and say oh this item is now available or whatever so lock and load publishing um here i'll minimize my screen so if you want to uh, www.lnlpublishing.com um, so that's that's what the leaders have the morale they have the uh, command uh, leadership command radius and then they have their movement points when you're talking about a squad or a half squad here they have three numbers along the bottom and this are going to represent the unit's firepower so in this case this unit's got a firepower too he's got a range of six so this is range and then last but not least is its movement points. 
and uh, then up in the top right hand corner just like the leader is the unit's morale as well so you have the morale you have their firepower you have your range and you have your uh, movement points and if they're color coded different colors you can see this half squad 154 there's no color coding on it uh, some of these units will have color coding behind the range or behind the firepower or behind the um, movement value and that represents different things so in this case when it's uh, behind the movement this unit can assault fire or fire assault which is now a new rule in the game uh, and they basically uh, allow for either the unit to move and then fire or to fire and then move so um, that's what that red button represents there is um, Uh, yeah, you got command ops now. Is that lock and load publishing as well? Um, I was actually, that's actually how I got to lock and load. Was I was looking up something the other night on command ops, and it took me to the lock and load website. I'm like, huh, I didn't know this is uh, being published by lock and load. And so then I got to looking around and I was like, ooh, there's all kinds of good stuff there. Good, good, good stuff. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, so we got our leaders. We have our, um, we have our men there. If we are talking about a support weapon, you have the firepower of the unit and then you have the uh, range of that. Now, Let's go over this. Uh, I'm going to move this unit down here. I'm going to move these guys out of the way. All right. Uh, so, if you have a uh, full squad here, and that full squad has a weapon, and normally you put the weapon directly below whatever unit has it. So, in this case, this 264 has a support weapon of the MG34. If a full squad can carry... Uh, up to two support weapons. Uh, let's clone that guy right there. All right. So um, if this unit here, this uh, full squad can carry up to two support weapons. And um, when it activates, which we'll talk about here in just a little bit. Um, but if this unit activates, it can either... Uh, it can either use its inherent firepower and one weapon, or it can shoot uh, both of the support weapons, but then it loses its uh, inherent firepower. So in this case, the two firepower that this unit actually has matches the two firepower, the MG34. So it doesn't really, um, the only th advantage of this is it's actually got a range of nine as opposed to the range of six. So normally you don't put more than one support weapon with a, a squad, a full squad. Um, you can, okay, you can. There's nothing nothing saying you can't because a full squad can carry two support weapons. So when you activate this guy, he can either use his inherent firepower in one of the machine guns, or he can lose his inherent firepower and just fire both of the machine guns. Either way, he's gonna end up having a firepower of uh, four total when this guy activates so that's a full squad a uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. a half squad uh, kind of just like you would figure uh, like a lot of other games out there let's put this below that all right a half squad can carry up to one support weapon and when it activates it can either use its inherent firepower or it can use its um, support weapon firepower so in this case if this guy activates you probably want to use the machine gun because it's got more firepower than just the actual uh, squad does uh, so that's that's how uh, support weapons work there your single man counters uh, Uh, so your leaders and such, they can carry, uh, they can carry one support weapon and, uh, you notice the leaders, uh, leaders, 
don't have any inherent firepower. They do other things, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. Uh, but they, you notice they don't have firepower. That's not firepower. That's their command range. Uh, so they have morale, they have command range, and they have movement points. Notice they don't have any firepower. So they can cover, uh, they can carry uh, one support weapon uh, it, with their own. Uh, when they activate to fire, they can use the support weapon at half value. So um, if, if this guy activated to fire, he would fire it at one firepower as opposed to the two firepower. Because he's, you know, he's only got one guy. Normally you have several men operating this, but he would be able to fire it with half firepower. But if a leader does that, they don't get to use their command bonus, which um, we'll talk about when we start talking about activations here in just uh, pretty soon. Pretty soon we're going to talk about that because that's a core, a very core mechanic with lock and load as opposed to a lot of other um, squad level or war games in general. They do a activation type system, uh, which I think, are we ready to talk about that yet? Uh, do, 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 um, I'm just trying to follow along with the rule book. So if you are got the rule book at home and you're rewatching this video, you can kind of follow along as I talk about things that are kind of in the, the rule book as we go along. Um, Right now we're on uh, chapter one. We're on about 1.61 ish. You know, I'm not I'm not covering everything word for word in the rule book. I'm just kind of going over the highlighted details because I think understanding the highlighted details and then watching how things operate is the way I've done a lot of ASL videos that hopefully helped a lot of people out there. And I'm going to do the lock and load system very similar to the way I did that. And I think that will help. So this is kind of the broad overview, and then we'll talk about specific. Um, we'll talk about specific things in other videos and other tutorials. So, Stratomatic Delaware, one of my greatest friends out there. How are you doing tonight? Hope all is well. Appreciate you stopping by, guys. If you're not familiar with Stratomatic Delaware, he does a lot of great sports simulations. Um, uh, retro replays he's very knowledgeable about a lot of subjects and you can definitely check him out on the new and updated chat with al and uh where al red sox fan hosts a couple of his subscribers and they get together and have a great time and they talk about everything so definitely check out al red sox fan as well al and stratomatic delaware and um dog sidious they are three characters that you guys don't want to miss that when they're they're having a good time talking about whatever subject comes up <laughs> uh so starting mac delaware been good uh i've been uh, interested in this game uh sure great great stop by and glad to stop by um so that was support weapons we're talking about I'm not going to get into details such as like uh, moving tripod weapons and jamming and satchel charges and stuff like that. I think it's I want to cover more of the important core rules. All right, so let's let's talk about that. So I'm actually going to zoom out a little bit and throw on a couple of Amer American, as uh, my good friend Stratomatic Delaware says, America. All right, so we're going to. Uh, uh, let's see here. We'll go to the 81st uh, Airborne here. That's fine. We'll take a couple paratroopers. We'll throw a couple paratroopers out here. And we'll throw out a couple leaders. Come on, leader. Come on. Where'd all my leaders go? We'll throw out him. And uh, we'll throw out a couple more of these guys. And we'll throw out this guy. And sure we'll throw out this guy and we'll throw out another guy here and we'll throw out sergeant hill there and i want to make sure i have enough guys for an example i don't want to get halfway through an example and then go oh no wait hang on a second 
All right. All right. So that's that's kind of good. All right. So uh, so what makes lock and load? Uh, we talked about this in the beginning. Uh, quite a bit different than most war games. If I was playing a war game, a normal, whether it be uh, you know a John Tiller game or Combat Commander or um, uh, let's see, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head, uh, ASL, um, uh, just about every war game out there. What happens is, uh, you know, if I'm playing the Germans, I activate all the Germans. I do all my movement, my shooting and recovery and I do all that stuff uh, and then at the end of my turn then it switches over and then the Americans take their turn and they activate all their units to move and fire and rally and do all their fun things and then it goes the end of the turn happens and then um, you know we start round two and then it goes back to the Germans and the Germans move and do all that that's not how lock and load does things. <clears throat> they do it by activations. So uh, normally in this scenario, it says who has the first turn uh, initiative. Uh, and uh, normally 99% of the time that's gonna be the attackers because it doesn't make any sense to give the defenders the initiative. Uh, and then what that person does is they activate <clears throat> one or several of their uh, units, uh, and we're going to show you the differences here, uh, to move or fire or do something for their activation. Uh, so, for an example here, let's say uh, we're doing this scenario here, the Germans, uh, let's just get rid of some of this stuff, it's kind of cluttering and it's making me uneasy here. Delete. Uh, probably don't want that right there. That would be a little unfair to the Americans, right? Uh, so delete, 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 uh, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna move I'm gonna move some more guys over here to make things a little more interesting. There we go. All right, so I'm gonna get rid of all the trails. There we go. So now we got like a an actual scenario here. Um, uh, I'm going to switch it up a little bit since the Germans are already in the town. I'm going to say that um, the uh, the Americans are attacking. The Germans own the town. And so we're at uh, turn number one here. Here's the turn track. And it's going to be the British and Americans have the initiative. <coughs> so what happens is the American player can do one of two things. He can either activate a unit or he can pass. That's it, one or the other. So he can say pass. If he passes and does nothing, then it goes to the German player and he can pass or he can activate one of his units. If he passes, uh, it goes back to the American and if the American passes, uh, so there's three passes in a row, then the turn o ends. So boom, done. So that turn ends and then it goes on to turn two. So obviously that's not gonna normally happen. At the American's turn, he's going to activate. So, you activate, you can do lots of different things when you do an activation. So, let's talk about the difference. I can activate this guy right here. And I can say, I'm going to activate this guy, and I'm going to activate him to move. And I go, you know, one, two, and three, four, and that's all his movement points. And then, so he would be done, and I would just put a move counter on him to show that he had moved. And that is the end of the American turn. Boom. It goes over to the German player. Now, the German player can do something. He can either pass or he can then activate one of his units. So one thing you can do is activate a guy, uh, an individual gentleman, and activate him to move. The other thing you can do is any of your leaders, a leaders that is not wounded. So if I uh, wound this guy here, uh, wounded, boom. A leader that's not wounded uh, has a command radius of uh, built in of one. So when I activate this leader down here, uh, let's, uh, let's actually, let's get rid of that wounded marker here. Uh, 
shake it. There we go. Let's get rid of that. So let's say he's not wounded. If this unit is not wounded, a leader, that is, if he uh, has a built-in command radius of one hex. So if I activate this guy, I can then activate everyone around him as well in one activation. So in one activation, I can activate all of these units by just activating this one leader. So even though it's activation based, um, you can activate more than just one uh, one unit at a time by activating uh, different leaders. Now, I don't have to activate all of these guys just because they're within range of the uh, hero, or the, I'm sorry, the leader. I can just say, I'm gonna activate this leader and he's gonna activate these guys here and that hex and this guy here. And I'm not gonna activate these guys. So I can, I can decide which one of these units within the command radius of the leader activates. Um, and uh, then, uh, then I would do my thing. Now, with that said, there are some restrictions on what you can or can't do with uh, the multiple activation. I'm going to actually slide this guy up there for a better example here. <clears throat> Uh, let's say this uh, leader, it's American turn, he's going to activate, he's going to activate all of these units all at the same time. All right, so he decided that. Units that are stacked together, if you decide to move them, they have to move together. Okay, so that might be a reason why if I activate this leader, I might not want to activate everyone. Because if I activate both of these guys with the leader, then both of these guys got to stay together. I can't go, okay, this guy here is going to move. Oop, uh, come here. Stop. Stop. Let's go back. Get rid of the trail. Uh, so if I activate these guys and they're stacked together, they have to stay together. So I can't go, okay, I want to move this guy here and I'm going to move this guy over this way. Can't do it. That's going to have to be two different activations. So you got to kind of pre-plan where you want your units to go because that way you know when you're going to activate them. If I activate all these guys together, then these units have to go together. So they have to move together and uh, move into wherever they're going to go. Now there is one exception to that. There is one very important exception, and that is if these units are moving together, and let's say this German unit uh, opportunity fires and uh, one of my units becomes shaken. Um, shaken units can't advance closer to the enemy units. This unit can continue moving without this unit. He can leave them behind. Uh, this unit can't then move anywhere else. It has to just stay where it's at. Uh, it, but I can continue the move, the rest of the move, without anybody that uh, breaks along the way, anybody that becomes shaken along the way. If they get left behind, they get left behind, and the rest of the units just keep moving. All right? So uh, if you activate units together, uh, they have to stay together during... Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Let's try again. Shaken, there we go. They have to stay together. So that's why you might not want to activate all your units at the same time. Uh, and then there's also strategy involved in that because if I'm, uh, you know, if I'm the German player or I'm defending, I might want to, you know, I might want to wait on good units to come within my range to opportunity fire. So I might, uh, you know, I say it might just, I might just say, okay, I'm going to activate this guy right here. He's going to move here and then move here and then move here, right? And then the German player might not opportunity fire him because he wants a juicier target and, uh, so he might not opportunity fire, but then I can activate, you know, then the German player gets to activate, then it goes back to the American. Now the American can then activate this guy and move him and move him and then move him into that hex. You don't have to. I could take this unit and I can move him down this way if I wanted to, or I could take this unit, I can move him over here. But I could trick the enemy because I've now activated uh, two different times and just actually move them together. Now I could have done that in one activation, but 
Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages, all that. So uh, the other restriction is, again, let's say we go back to the uh, beginning example here, Sergeant Hill. I'm, I'm the American player. I'm going to activate Sergeant Hill. I'm going to activate everyone else. Just like move orders, if the um, if these units are going to fire, they have to fire at the same um, they have to fire at the same target. So I can't separate my attacks. I can say, well, this guy is going to fire at this guy, and this other guy, the 054, is going to shoot at this guy. Can't do that. That's going to have to be two different activations. If you activate together, you have to fire together. So, and you have to shoot at the same target. There are, of course, some exceptions to that as well. Um, can units talk, toss smoke bombs? Yes, there is smoke in, this, uh, in um, lock and load. It's normally um, a, a scenario, uh, if you look at the scenario card, uh, for example, if we look at a scenario card here, it would say on the scenario card so much, there's so much smoke uh, that you can use. Depending on the scenario, it would tell you can use, you know, so many, you know, smoke canisters or whatever. Uh, and then um, it'll tell you what your activation number is. So it might say the American activation for smoke is two, which means you need to roll two or less on a six-sided die not dice, six-sided die, uh, to actually activate, uh, to get this, to, you know, get the smoke canister, that unit, uh, you know, there is no smoke counter at all in the game. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a roll, and if you make it, then you have the smoke. If you roll and miss it, then either units didn't know he was smoke, so, uh, supposed to throw smoke or uh, anything like that. So it's a it's a game of uh, back and forth activations, uh, back and forth between the two players. Each player taking one activation, which can activate a whole bunch of things or nothing. Um, if this guy was over here, for example, um, and we were, uh, you know, back to our turn here. And the American player here on the first turn of the first scenario here, uh, let's put this guy back there. There we go. I'm just going to slide this out of the way. There we go. So let's say this is turn one of the scenario. The American player gets to activate, and he says, I'm going to activate Lieutenant Mitchell, who then activates this guy and these guys and this hex. And he's also going to activate Sergeant Hill, and he's going to activate the unit that's in with Sergeant Hill. And when Sergeant Hill activates, he can then do the same thing where he says, okay, I'm going to activate this guy and these guys as well. So with this one activation, I can basically activate every single person I have on my side um, by doing, uh, I'm not sure what they actually call it, but leaders can activate other leaders, which then can activate other leaders. And you can have a whole chain you can chain your level of leaders back down the line and everyone adjacent to them if you wanted to. Again, it's totally open-ended for the player to decide. So, you know, you might want to think about that when you're moving units around, uh, you know, keeping your units, you know, obviously if we were to take these guys and move them over here, right, and then these guys over here moved up over there, then the next turn in turn number two, I couldn't activate this guy and activate everyone because they're not obviously adjacent to one another. So thinking about positioning of your units for your activations is a very, very important for you. Uh, so uh, that's kind of the, um, the core. I'm just going to get rid of the turn track because we don't actually need it. Um, so that's kind of the core concept that makes lock and load. It's very... Uh, if you're playing face to face, or even if you're playing, um, you know, even if you're playing solo, uh, it can be very interesting because you're constantly involved in the game. Uh, because your other, you know, your other opponent's your opponent's turn is only going to take, you know, 30 seconds or maybe a minute, and then it's going to be back to you. It's not like you got to sit there for five minutes waiting for your guy, you know, your opponent to move all of his units. 
oh my god come on dude hurry up you know move all your freaking units already um you know and a lot of times it'll be a matter of uh, you know most scenarios you don't have the units stacked right on top of one another so there's there's some leeway and you know positioning you know the american's gonna you know try and get up and get some units in, into cover here and you know his activations and the german player might be doing the same thing where he's trying to get units up and uh getting into position and then you know then we're on to turn two and then it comes time to ooh, when it comes time for turn two what happens is uh each player rolls a die and whoever rolls higher gets the initiative so um you know, we'll say the first die is the Americans, the second die is the Germans. So in this case, the Americans roll the three, the Germans roll the five, they get the initiative. So now it's a, you know, might be a great opportunity to fire at someone. But oh, wait, there's more, my friends. Oh, yes, there are a lot more to lock and load than just shooting at someone. And this is kind of the most... I guess misunderstood or what's what's a really good word I'm thinking about um, misconception in the rule book is you can't shoot at anyone that you haven't spotted so there are if we go into the markers here one of the most important markers you will actually use is the spotted marker or uh is it i thought it was a red one but i could be wrong uh moved up sweet shaken spotted spotted round do, 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 do. no i think it must be the brown one i was thinking it was red for some reason maybe it's just color coded uh darker inside the vassal module so you can't actually spot anyone or you can't actually shoot at anyone that you haven't spotted and there are rules for spotting I'm just going to cover the basics right now uh, and because spotting is such an important part we're probably going to spend like an episode talking about spotting and a few other rules but it's uh, let's just cover the basics uh, so no units spotted unless several things happen if the unit is in open terrain uh, then they're automatically spotted by anyone uh, that can see them with line of sight so this unit here can see this guy because he's in the open there's nothing there that he can hide in uh, you know if he was here he'd be out in the open here he's out in the open etc um, so if you're out in the open, bad. You don't want to be out in the open because everybody and their brother can shoot at you. Sometimes you can't you can't help it though, right? You can't help it. I mean, you're, you're moving up and then you run out of moving points or whatever. And so, you know, if you're kind of out in the open, uh, you know, can't always be in. And that's another thing to think about is, you know, okay, well, this guy's only got four moving points. Uh, he can only go so far. You know, I can go one, two, three, uh, four or five. Nope, can't do that. Oh, wait, but I can. We'll talk about that here in a minute. There is something called double time, which we'll talk about here in just a second, but I don't want to get too confusing here. So units that are out in the open can be spotted automatically. Uh, units that are adjacent to an enemy are automatically uh, spotted unless you are... Um, let's pull that guy out and put this guy in there uh where is he where is he shaken if you're shaken you do not automatically see adjacent enemies the american would definitely know the germans there the german does not know the americans are there basically what that represents is the americans know you can see these guys but these guys are like hunkered down uh you know they're inside this building uh they might be you know crouched down behind the windows they're not they're they're not lifting their heads up in the window to spot anyone or anything they're just laying on the ground afraid you know and everything so they don't automatically see uh somebody else that is um that is uh adjacent to them so just keep that in mind shaking units don't automatically uh see these guys would automatically see one another no problem uh, anytime a unit has a marker on it, 
which we will put on here. Uh, let's see, we need, uh, what do we need? We need a moved marker. Sure, we'll grab one of these. We we'll use a fire marker. Oh, maybe the red one was the fire marker. So if a unit is fired or a unit has moved, they are automatically spotted as well. So you can see that um, if the American player, you know, we're at the start of turn two, right? And the German player is the defender here uh, and the German player wins the initiative. He could try to spot, which we'll talk about here in a second, or he can just pass. He's, you know, put the onus on the Americans because when the Americans move, they're going to get a move marker on it. And once they get a move marker, they're automatically going to be spotted. The other thing to keep in mind is that uh, anything spotted with a spotted marker on it, um, you don't spot units, you spot the hex. And that will come into play for several um, unique rules or rules um, that we're not going to get into in, in this episode here. But you, when you spot, you spot the whole hex. So if for some reason, um, let's say this guy had moved in there and now it's the American's turn to activate and the American moves this guy into that hex, um, he's automatically be, going to be spotted because that unit sees everyone in that hex because it's spotted. So uh, you, you, you don't spot units, you spot the hex. Uh, and everyone, um, let's see, uh, so this guy was spotted because he's out in the open. That'll, that marker will actually stay on there. Let's say this guy moves out of that hex. And then uh, this marker will actually stay on that hex until this, you know, then this guy leaves, then this marker goes away. So uh, if this was the case, again, when this guy moves into that hex, we automatically spot everyone in there because we've already spotted that hex. So uh, I hope and I explain that. It's kind of uh, easier to comprehend than it is to kind of explain. Um, so units out in the open, units with a moved or fire marker or... Um, let's see what other marker is there. Oh, uh, there's one exception to this rule and that is a low crawl. Um, so basically on a, ro a low crawl, a unit will uh, move from one hex to another hex, and he'll use a low crawl. If he does that, then he's not automatically spotted. Okay? So a uh, unit with a low crawl on it is not automatically spotted. That's about the only counter I can think of that... Uh, the wounded doesn't mean you're automatically spotted either. Basically a fire or move counter, which is 99% of the time you're going to be putting fire and move counters because, you know, the attacker is going to be moving and firing. Um, and then the last thing you can do is actually you could try and spend your activation to spot an enemy and uh, see if you can do it. And it's a dice roll. And there are some specific rules on that. It is, um, what section is that of the rule book? It is, um, it's like 10 something, right? Now that's terrain. I think it's section 10 spotting. I think maybe it is. Let's see. Mm, line sight spotting and terrain. All right, so yeah, I will actually read you because, like I said, I might have been explaining it pretty bad if I just read it to you. It might actually be uh, more uh, easier for you. Um, a hex, and thus, and thus all units within it, is spotted if any of the following applies. A hex in open terrain. So again, open terrain, boom, definitely spotted. A hex is marked with a spotted marker. Uh, poof. Uh, we'll put it uh, on this guy there. All right. Uh, good order friendly unit is adjacent to a hex. Um, a good order unit auto spots all six adjacent hexes. So 
good order unit is somebody that's not shaken. If you are not shaken, you're considered in good order, I believe. There might be an exception to that, but uh, you know, for all the units we have here on the board, um, a unit is actively moving or assaulting in or through a hex. A hex, a unit in a hex is marked with a moved, a assault moved, a fired or a melee marker. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Low crawling units and units of stealth do not create a spotted hex. Uh, once this hex is spotted, it is spotted for all friendly units during the entire turn until the such time where all units leave the spotted hex. So once a hex is spotted, until all the units leave that hex, all of my units, whether they can see them right now or not, so like literally the only guy that can see this guy right now is this guy here. Um, I'll say this guy was down here in the road. He obviously doesn't have line of sight because this building's blocking him. But once a hex is spotted, it's spotted for the entire turn for all of your enemy units. So this guy will automatically now see those units, and even though he couldn't originally see them. And that's kind of a uh, important rule, and I think a lot of a lot of times people get a little confused. Once uh, once it's spotted, it's spotted for the whole turn until, like I said, the unit's got to get out of that hex. And once all the units leave, then you remove the spotted marker. There are some exceptions to that. Um, you will not remove the spotted marker basically when somebody assault fires or fire assaults. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about that because there's some specific um, sp some specific rules on that. Uh, so, uh, do, 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 what else? Um, okay, so you can also try to make spotting attempts uh, for your activation. So again, uh, let's say this guy was here all right let's um there uh, let's get rid of all the markers delete admin rule oh there we go so we're on to start a turn two and the german player has the initiative um you know we rolled a three for the americans five for the germans so again just an example here so the germans they can't shoot anybody because nobody's out in the open everybody's in uh, terrain so what they could do is they could actually uh activate someone to try and spot so it's like hmm i think there's guys in there let's check it out and see if there's somebody in there and basically um i'm gonna show you this i'm gonna have to pull up a chart to kind of give you some better example here because this all has to do with the terrain and we need the terrain chart before i can actually show you so you can actually see All right, so here we go. That didn't take me too long. So if you look at the uh, World War II terrain target modifier chart, all terrain is either blocking terrain or degrading terrain. So basically, blocking terrain blocks line of sight. It blocks attacks through it. It blocks, uh, you know, you can't shoot through a building i mean it makes sense if there's a if we look at the buildings here uh down here at the bottom it's blocking uh if you got a, a thick forest it's going to block because you can't see through a thick forest etc and then there are degrading things like um brushes uh or uh white forest where you know you got a few trees but not a whole bunch of trees so there's degrading terrain and then there is blocking terrain. So that's kind of important that you uh, understand that concept. So based upon the terrain the player is in, if I go to spot, if they're in degrading terrain or they're in blocking terrain will determine uh, my chance of him spotting him or not. Uh, that is section 10. I'm just trying to get the, uh, the actual rule back up now that I, there it is. All right. 
So if it's blocking terrain, so buildings are blocking terrain, uh, like these thick forest hex down here, like down there, that's all blocking terrain. These buildings are blocking terrain. Uh, these light forest here, this is what they call light forest. This is degrading terrain, right? So if um, the German player has the initiative and because it's the start of a new turn, Everyone's kind of gathered their wind, the reloading weapons, and now it's like, okay, who, who, where do we shoot? Who do we see? And we don't see anyone because no one's out in the clear, no one's adjacent to us, blah, 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 blah. So now we have to try to spot, we got to try and spot somebody. So the German player could just easily say pass. Okay, I want an initiative, but I'm going to pass. I'm going to, you know, I'm the, I'm the defender. I don't need to get the victory points. I, I already have the victory points. You need to come get them. And make the make the American player move and fire and do all of his things. Because once he moves and fires, then he'll have these moves and fire counters on him. But if the German player was like, hey, I don't want to wait. I want to just, I want to try and spot you. You can do that. So you can try to spot the enemy. And in this case, uh, again, it's based upon the terrain the player is in. Again, this player is in degrading terrain. If he's in degrading ter terrain, you need to roll a one, two, or three, one, two, or three to spot him. So you just simply roll a die. I rolled a four. Nope, I did not see him. So in that case, the uh, leader here gets a special marker on it, which we haven't talked about. That's ops complete. So the leader gets an ops complete marker on him. Ops complete means, uh, I'm not going to get into all the details about ops complete, but uh, basically it means he's done something. So this unit can't do much else. Okay. I know that's kind of not a good, uh, a good reason, but um, it's kind of, kind of what it represents. I've tried to spot and I, and I failed and now I can't do anything. Um, actually, what I need to do is uh, I want to have a good example when we do that. So uh, ops complete when you fail a spot check. Is there an AI role for this game? No, there's no AI in Vassal whatsoever. You are on your own. There is no AI built into Vassal. Vassal is just a game engine so that you can play the game either with an opponent or solo by yourself, but you have to do everything for yourself. All right, uh, I'm gonna try and uh, redo this scenario again. Um, a, uh, let's say the uh, a German player does end up spotting. Let's roll another die here. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Two. There we go. So he ended up spotting him. If uh, a leader uh, spots the enemy, oh yeah, there they are, boys. They can immediately activate to do a, a do an attack uh, with that activation. So basically, when the leader spots him, he can then command everyone, fire! So in this case, uh, if we look at our, um, we got a half squad here, and he's got a uh, MG34. So the, uh, the half squad's gonna give up its inherent firepower. He's gonna activate the MG34 for two firepower. This leader has a command bonus of one, so we're gonna get a command bonus of one. And they would do an attack of three against this unit because he's now been spotted. Of course, we would take our little markers and we would put a little uh, spotted marker on this space so we know that that space has been uh, spotted out by someone. Uh, so that that um, so that's that. So so we've talked about a lot, but the last thing we're actually going to show you guys is we're going to give you an example of how combat is handled okay we're going to show you an example of how combat's handled in this game uh, uh all right so i'm going to actually i'm going to reposition some guys here so i can get a better uh a better example here for you guys here uh all right so we're going to put that guy in there as well all right there we go 
All right, because obviously uh, knowing how to do things is going to be uh, kind of important, right? Uh, we're going to put this guy with him. All right, that's good. All right. All righty. Okay, here we go. All right, so uh, the uh, German player is spotting the American player. He does his attack. We're just going to say he misses, doesn't do any effect. So now it's the American player's turn. And the American player is then deciding what he wants to do. And he decides that he is going to activate Sergeant Hill uh, to try and spot this German down here. We look and see, okay, he is in a building. Building or blocking terrain, so he can only spot on a two or less. So degrading terrain is three or less. Building hex is uh, two or less. Uh, hmm. Actually, no. You know what he's going to do? He's not going to try to spot. Um, and to be totally honest, there is actually a paragraph in the book here that I think is ultra, ultra important because... I think, again, the spotting rules are very important because you can't shoot at somebody that you can't see, okay? And a lot of people get tripped up. Oh, I don't like the lock and load system because I need to keep, you know, remembering who, I'm, who I see, who I can't see. And it doesn't make sense to me that I know there's guys in that building, but I can't see them. And, and then two minutes later... I can't see them again, so then I have to respot them, and that just doesn't make any sense, okay? And so that's a lot of the complaints, or you know, people that go, "Oh, I don't know about this system." Um, but here's what I will say, and it's actually a, uh, a paragraph inside the actual core rule book, and I think it explains it ultra well. And this is: experienced players rarely make spotting attempts. They let the turn's gameplay and the actions of both player units create spotted hexes through their fire and movement and other actions that reveal and expose hexes containing enemy units. Spotting attempts are done tactically only early during turns or in desperate circumstances. And I think that explains it perfectly. As, as I've been kind of trying to show you is, as a defender, if, if let's say, uh, the American objective is to get, um, let's throw out some objective hexes here. Uh, acquire, no, uh, let's see here. Is there objective hex? Um, hmm. event I'm just going to use this and uh, this as an example so let's say the example is uh, the American player needs to capture this building and this building by the end of turn eight whatever you know whatever it happens to be as a German player I don't I I'm gonna win the scenario and this American does that so I'm in no I'm in no need to try to spot him i'm in i'm in no need it's 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 up to the american player to get these objectives and the only way the american player can get these objectives is by moving and firing and killing my guys so that he can get over here and get this objective if i'm playing smart and the american player is playing smart they're going to be moving units and as soon as this guy moves and I fire, let's get some more marker, fire marker, right? And I get a fire marker, then all of a sudden his units can see my units because I've fired with them. And when his unit fires, then I can see him, his, this unit. And when these guys move down here, they're going to be moved. And, uh, you know, once they're moved, then this guy's going to be able to fire at him because he can see the move counter. And this guy's adjacent to him. So... It, spotting is not as big a deal as a lot of people try to make it out in this game for that reason. Because one of the sides is going to be moving and trying to get the objective, or both sides in some cases, 
uh, are going to be moving and trying to get the objective. And once you start moving and firing, then all of a sudden hexes are going to be spotted automatically. And then you will have plenty of opportunity to, you know, fire and shoot and spot your enemy units as, as that, uh, paragraph I think really kind of represents experienced players rarely make spotting attempts unless it's very early in the turn or under under, under dire circumstances like let's say for example um, uh, the German uh, the American player has got to get this objective he knows there's units there he doesn't want to run across the open territory uh, and expose himself to open fire no one else can see this guy so in that case he might want to try to spot these guys so he can shoot them um you know as the german player i'm like i'm not using these units so you can't see them right so in that case i would have to try to spot them so in that case it's a de desperate circumstance that you would use to try to spot the unit uh, and then, of course, like I said, at the very beginning of the turn, if I'm the defender and I don't want to wait and I have a good opportunity, I might want to try and spot a unit so I can shoot him before he can shoot me, you know. Uh, so that would be kind of the other thing. You don't you don't spend half your time trying to spot enemy units. You're just going to automatically start spinning them, which you guys will see when we uh, we start doing a scenario. OK, so I just I just wanted to bring that up. Um, one other thing we talked we talked very briefly about is the fact that uh, movement points here notice the leader has a movement point of six this guy has a movement point of four movement of four movement of four you notice most of the squads have a movement factor of four um leaders do not give movement factor bonuses at all but the um the squads can do what they call double time and when you double time, you get two extra movement points for your double time squad. Your leaders don't get the bonus, but your squads do. So that basically gives them uh, equal to the six points of your leader. So you can double time your you can double time your uh, squads, give them six movement points, and then you know, uh, say we we're back here, it'd be one, two, three, four, five, six. So you can move a little bit farther if you double time. Uh, so I just wanted to bring that up because I kind of mentioned that earlier, but we didn't talk about it that much. All right, so we were showing an example of, that's what we were doing. I knew there was something I was missing here. Um, right, where did our leader go? Where did our leader go? Here, all right. All right, so uh, just going to move this all this stuff oops try and move this stuff back so I don't there we go all right so all right so it's uh, the start of turn number two or whatever the scenario happens to be it's Americans impulse let's just say it's Americans impulse so for the Americans impulse uh, the Americans decide to move uh, Sergeant Hill and uh, this squad underneath them, and they're going to activate to move. And uh, since they're in the same hex, they have to move together, they have to stay together, blah, blah, blah. So in this case, uh, what the American has in planned is he's going to kind of sacrifice these guys so that these guys can shoot this guy and kill him and get them out of there because maybe this is objective hex or whatever so in this case um these guys are going to move and they're going to move uh one movement factor to move there and when they move there uh th they can be spotted by the german the german can spot them because they're adjacent they're both in good order so in that case the german player is then going to take his opportunity fire so this gives us a good example to show you how uh how combat works here. Uh, so for combat, what you're going to do is you're going to activate. Uh, you're going to you're going to uh, figure out what your firepower is for your unit. In this case, he's got a firepower of two. He's got a range of six. Well, he's well within range. 
and because this guy is adjacent, he gets a plus two bonus to his firepower. So in this case, he gets four firepower for this um, for this attack on the uh, the units here. And what he does is he rolls a six-sided dice and he adds his bonus to it. So he's got a four and he's gonna roll a, uh, a single die. And uh, let's see, let's just put some text in here so we can separate, so we can see. All right, so he's got a four and he rolled a two, so he's got a total of six. All right, so six. So what the defender does then is he rolls a six-sided dice and he gets any terrain bonus for whatever he, uh, whatever is you know if he was in the building or if he was in the light woods or the heavy woods each terrain has their own uh, defense Oops, I'll show you here in just a second if I can find it again uh, they have their own uh, target modifier so uh, let's see that's a good example here a forest is a plus two, light woods is a plus one, marsh is a plus one, a stone building is plus four, a wooden building is plus three, and I'll, I'll show you the difference here. The units, uh, the buildings with the red dot are stone, heavy construction, heavy buildings, uh, so they're plus four. And the buildings with the white or black dot, depending on if it's on dark terrain or light terrain, uh, those are wood buildings, and they are uh, plus three. So this guy uh, is going to roll, and he is going to have, um, uh, each of his units are going to have to make a check here. And what we have to do is find out whether this guy uh, hit, hit anybody or not. He rolled a two. Plus his modifier for his uh, firepower. In this case, it's uh, it's uh, uh, actually it's not. It's going to be I forgot. He's going to he's going to be moving. So anytime you shoot at a move somebody that with the move counter, or they're in the process of moving, you get a plus one. So two plus one plus two because he's adjacent. So he's actually got five plus two is a seven. In this case, the defender rolls his. Um, Terrain modifier, which we can see is zero because he's out in the open, right? Yep, out in the open. Uh, and he rolls a six-sided dice as well. So this will be the Americans. And he rolled a two. So you calculate the defensive total and you calculate the offensive total and you find out. If the offensive total is higher than the defensive total, then it's a hit. If it's equal to or less than the defensive total, then uh, you know he might have hit, but nothing happened, or he missed, or whatever. Uh, so in that case, it's just a it's just a whiff if that was the case. But in this case, he has a two. He rolled a two. Uh, we had a total of seven, and he had zero. So a zero plus two is a two. And so the difference, then what you're going to do is once we determine it's a hit, you find the difference between them, between the total of the attacker and the total of the defender. So it's seven and a total of two. So the difference is five. So the next thing we do is we do a morale check for each of these guys. All right. And we start with the leader here. He's got a morale of six, right? And we're going to roll a six-sided dice, and we're going to add to it whatever the difference between these two dice rolls was. In this case, our example is five. And uh, then we're going to compare that to his morale. So if we roll a single-sided dice, <laughs> rolled another two. So two plus five is seven. So... If you roll equal to or less than your morale, then nothing happens. If you roll higher than your morale, but less than double your morale, so in this case it'd be less than uh, 12, then you become uh, shaken uh, or wounded. In this case, a, wound, a leader becomes wounded. So the leader becomes wounded in the attack, and now we're going to roll for the squad as well. Uh, actually, no. 
He did not become wounded. He became a shaken. Sorry, he just became shaken. He did not become wounded. You have to double uh, double the attack value to become wounded. He became shaken. Uh, so this guy, uh, if the leader would have passed his check, uh, he would give his bonus. But you notice on the back, his leadership modifier is nothing. So he's going to give no bonus to this guy. And this guy's going to roll a die as well. It's a three plus five is eight. Eight is higher than five. So this guy also becomes shaken as well. If these units were already shaken, then they would be Cassie reducers a chart that you can use to, I'm not sure if they actually have this chart in the actual rule book. Let's see. Kind of makes sense they would. I don't remember seeing it though. That's the thing. Let's just scroll down and see if we can find the chart. Do, 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 do. Come on, come on. Oop. Uh. Uh, I'm just looking through to see if I see the chart anywhere in the rules. There's the terrain chart. But I don't remember seeing the, um, the other chart. Might be in here somewhere. Uh, let's see. Here's some charts here. Okay, here it is. I did find it. It is in there. So if you download the rules, uh, so good order, uh, multi-main counter, or if they're shaken. So basically, if the die roll is less than or equal to the morale, nothing's going to happen, right? So you got to be higher than the morale. If the die roll is higher than the morale, but less than two times the morale, then they're going to become shaken if they're good order. If they're already uh, shaken, then they're going to take casualties. Uh, and uh, your heroes are going to start taking wounds. Uh, so you just follow this chart, basically. So the higher, um, the higher the difference between the attack and the defensive rolls, uh, the bigger chance you're going to have of uh, causing more damage. So let's say our attack was, you know, five total, and this was a four total. Then the only the difference is the only difference is a one. If I'm rolling one on my morales, well, we're gonna we're gonna show you another example. So um, so this guy is fired now, right? Because the opportunity fired. Both of these guys become shaken, uh, and then it goes back to the German turn. And so the German says, uh, let's see, does he have any good shots we can? Um, let's see. Hmm. Well, Uh, just for kicks, just to show you an example, uh, we'll say the uh, German player decides to activate this unit right here to fire. You can see it's a full squad because there's two guys in, in the counter, uh, single counters or half squads. So as a, uh, if you're just joining us, as a full squad, they can shoot one support weapon plus their firepower together. Uh, and they will do that. So you can see there's two for the MG34. There is two for the inherent firepower of the squad. So that is four firepower. Again, they have to shoot. Uh, you can't separate. Do one attack with the machine gun at one guy and your squad a different guy. They all have to go together. Just remember if you 
basically if you're in the same spot you have to attack the same spot so they can't can't shoot the machine gun over there and then shoot my guys over here doesn't doesn't work that way so um so four firepower if we look at our uh, let's see this is page uh, 214 and I'll remember that in case I need to come back to it uh, what was the terrain modifier for I wish the uh, terrain modifier chart would be included in this module but it's not so 214 was the other one let's go up here and buildings where are you buildings it is a wooden building because it's got a black dot right uh, black or white dot yes the only ones with the red dots are the ones that are um, concrete and uh, stone and they give you the better bonus so the wood building is a defensive bonus of three all right so we got four firepower we're attacking that building we don't have any degrading terrain in the way uh, so like if we were shooting over these crops or over these bushes there would be degrading terrain which we would worry about but in this case it's just a clear line of sight from these guys um, oh actually I can't shoot at these guys because again I can't spot them right I knew there was a reason why I didn't want oh let's just say that for some reason um, I'd say these guys had uh, say they earlier in the turn they had moved up here so they have a move counter on them okay just because I want to show you a couple examples of how to op operate combat here. So they have a move counter on them. So once again, uh, four firepower. I'm shooting at someone that had moved. Anytime someone moves, then you get a plus one because you know they haven't gotten into position. They haven't hunkered down. Uh, you know, and again, this represents the whole two to four minutes of game time. It's not just representing the fact that they're finally arriving at this building and you know all that so so four firepower plus one there is a total of five firepower and i roll a six-sided dice again i'm going to put some just some text in there to separate the attacks so we can see so germans are going to roll and they want to roll really high they roll the five so five plus five is ten now the defense the defenders uh and we don't have a leader so we can do these in any order we want uh, this guy here, it gets a plus three because of the building, right? So he's going to roll a die, add three, and he rolled a one. So he's going to have a total of four. All right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we're going to assume that the guy sh uh, was, these guys were shooting at this guy right here. Um, so he's got a difference of our He's got a total of one plus three for the building is four. Again, our attack was a four, five plus five is ten. So that's a huge difference again. Ten versus four. The difference is six. So six is the difference. So now we got to roll a, a morale check for this guy. Roll a single die. He rolls a four plus six is ten. And that's going to be higher than his morale, but less than double his morale. So he's going to become uh, shaken. So he just becomes shaken. These guys, of course, get the fire marker on them. And uh, yeah, so then we're done with that. And it goes back to the American turn. So American turn and now going to show you how we're going to do um, combined fire here. So. Uh, we're going to activate this Lieutenant Michael, who can now spot this guy because he's fired. He's got a fire marker on him, and he's going to shoot, and he's going to activate all these guys to shoot. So the way a combined fire works is you can't combine fire outside your hex. So uh, these guys can't combine fire with this guy. The only people that can combine fire are the people that are inside that hex with the leader and what you do is you pick out your main attack person and they contribute all of their firepower and everyone else contributes half their firepower uh, and I'm going to do this 
uh, I'm going to throw this guy in this in this fight for good example. All right, there we go. So the the main attackers are going to be the two five four, obviously, because we want our best attacker. And then the one five four contributes half, so we get half of one, which is half a point. And then the one six four contributes half of their firepower, which is again a half a firepower. So it's going to be two plus a half plus a half. So that's going to be two, three. So three total firepower with the attack. And then we get to add one for the leader, Lieutenant Mitchell, his leadership bonus. So the total firepower for this attack is going to be two for the main attack and a half and a half for another one point plus uh, one for the leader. Now, interesting enough, I'm now going to take this guy out of that, all right? And we're going to recalculate. We're going to say that it was just these three guys that were attacking, okay? So if we calculate this again, come on, pop up. There you go. Uh, our, main, our main attack is going to be a 254. And then we get half firepower from our 154. So we get two and a half firepower from that guy. And uh, every single time you do rounding in lock and loading, you always, 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 always round up. There is one exception to this rule one and only one exception to this rule and it's got to do with vehicles so if you're not dealing with vehicles which are not um there's one time we actually round down when you're and i have to look at the rule again but every other time you actually round up so we get two plus a half is two and a half we round up to three firepower so notice we have the same amount of firepower with this guy in that hex or not in that hex so something else to keep in mind when you're moving your units yeah moving your units around again there is advantages to keeping your units all in one hex and there are advantages to not putting your units all in one hex uh, but in this case we still have the same amount of firepower Two and a half rounds up to three. We get our leader bonus of one. So we get a total of four firepower with this those units as opposed to uh, throwing this unit in as well. So four firepower. Uh, and we look at our defensive terrain bonus here. And that's just going to be a plus three for the uh, wood building. So four firepower. Uh, we have no degrading terrain in between the hexes. Obviously, everybody's within range, so we roll a six-sided dice. He rolls a three, plus his four is a total of seven. The defender gets a three plus a six-sided dice. He rolls three plus two is five. Is the attack higher than the defense? Seven versus five. Yes, it is higher. What is the difference? The difference is two. So this guy needs to make a morale check. And we're going to add two to his chance. So we take the dice, we roll it. Four plus two, which is the difference, is six. And is six higher than five? It is. Is it more, double his morale? No, it would have to be ten. Uh, again, we, you would look at that chart, but pretty much it's it's uh, you know up up to his morale. Nothing happens if. Uh, his morale uh, up to double his morale. He's shaken. If he's if he's uh, trip up up to triple, he's casually reduced and shaken. You know, you kind of learn that chart because it's not very hard, right? Okay. So in this case, uh, six is higher than five, so this guy becomes shaken, and uh, these guys become uh, marker fired oop, fired right and so they're fired so that's how you do a combined fire attack you choose your main attack person and that can include any support weapons as well so uh let me build another one here if you don't if you guys give me just a second here 
So we got this guy with his gun. Um, I'll bring this guy over as well. And we'll bring the leader over here. So uh, just for an example, again, you know, um, uh, the Americans are done. So it would go back to the German turn. So the German player can now go, oh, I'm going to take these units. I'm going to activate these units to fire. And we are going to announce our main attack. Uh, in this case, our main attack is going to be a half squad, which has an MG-34. Uh, remember, half squads can either shoot their inherent firepower, which is one, or they can use one support weapon at full capacity. So in this case, our lead unit is going to be the both the MG-34 and the half squad, uh, the 154. So that is going to give us two firepower. And every other unit is going to give us half firepower. So our 154 is going to give us another half of firepower. So that is going to be two plus a half is two and a half. Again, rounding up, it goes to three. And then the Ken Lieutenant Coach, Koch, Lieutenant Koch gives us one modifier. So that is going to be a total of four firepower again. So four firepower attacking this hex right there. Four plus a die roll of six. So attacker total of 10. Defender, uh, in this case, we're going to try and shoot at this guy. Uh, of course, you would announce that ahead of time. But we're shooting at this guy here. Uh, actually, let me see. I think... Do you have to pick out a unit, or do you just attack everyone? I'm sometimes, you know, I get confused with all these different tactical systems. I have to double check things. Uh, let me just double check because I don't want to steer you guys wrong. I'm actually looking. Um, I think you actually, it doesn't actually say it. Just says the attacker and then, you know, you add it together and then you do the same thing for the defender. Roll 1d6, add the target modifier. I think you choose your target. I'm pretty sure you do. So that's what I'm going to go with. I could, I'll have to double check that, but I'm pretty sure you choose. You don't just get to shoot at everyone. You have to choose who you're shooting at. So in this case, uh, we had a total of 10 for the attack. Defense, again, um, defending was the building. It's a plus three modifier. So he rolls a die, adds three. So three plus one is four. So defense total four, three for the building, one for the D6, and attack total 10, four plus his die roll is six. So the difference between the attack and the defense is how much? Six. Uh, so you know, before we do that, actually, we have to go, is 10 higher than five? Yes, of course, 10 is higher than five. So what's the difference? The difference is six. So now we know this guy's going to be at least shaken because we're going to add six to whatever the die roll is. The die roll is a three, so six plus three is nine. So he just missed getting double his uh, double his morale. If he would have been doubled, he'd have been casually reduced and he would have been eliminated. So he just if we rolled a four, five, or six on that die, we would have killed this guy because he's a he's a half squad. So he would have casually reduced. He would have been eliminated completely. But 
We came oh so close, but we did shake him. Uh, shaken units that fail their morale check. Let's say this guy was already shaken, and he fails the morale check. Then he does become casualty reduced, and then he, you know, he would be removed because he's casualty reduced. Uh, full squad, obviously, if this guy was um, shaken, and then he uh, attack him again, and he fails his, uh, you know, fails his check. Uh, he would get casually reduced, so he becomes a half squad that's shaken. So full squads become half squads, half squads become eliminated. So that's pretty much how that works. Pretty easy there. Um, notice as shaken, you cannot move closer to a known enemy unit. So if this guy was, uh, let's say this guy was here. Uh... No, that's kind of a bad example. This guy was here, and he's shaken. Uh, he doesn't actually know about any enemy units because he has no line of sight to anybody. Line of sight this way is blocked, and this line of sight is blocked this way. If he looks between the buildings, he doesn't see anything. So this guy can actually spend two movement points to move there. He could not move this way because once he's in this building he can then see this guy's down here or this guy down here so he cannot continue moving forward that way but the shaken units can't move closer uh to known enemies uh there's other rules that have to deal with shaken um but we're not going to cover all those rules right now what else was there the double time we talked about uh, anybody have any questions about the combat? So combat's pretty actually pretty simple. You get the attacker value, total attack, total defense. Each side rolls the six sider and adds those together. If the attacker's higher, uh, then you roll again to see if this guy becomes um, broken or shaken or uh, casualties or whatever. Uh, what else? Um, if you move into a hex with an, uh, let's say, um, let's say there was a, this German right here, and these guys earlier in the round had become shaken, right? Uh, what's this hex? Oops, this is a move hex, right? So both of these guys are shaken. Uh, I could go one, two, three, four, and I could move into that sex hex. Uh, and then that would start a melee. But basically what I wanted to show you guys is if all of the units on one side are shaken, uh, they're going to be um, removed when the melee starts. And so you can, what you want to do in this game is you don't necessarily need to kill off everyone. You need to shake them uh, and then uh, go in and melee them and remove them. It's a good way of... Uh, uh, doing things, uh, break them. At the beginning of the turn, uh, any hero that's with uh, a unit that is uh, shaken that gives them a morale check to see if they pass their morale check. Uh, and let's see, uh, I'll give you an example here. So after after a turn is over, right? A turn is over. Uh, all the markers come off, right? Oh, not all the pieces. All the markers come off. And then we start in, you know, we go to round number two. Where's our turn track? Yeah, go to turn number two. And then any leader that's stacked with a broken uh, or shaken guy uh, can try to rally them. In fact, leaders, uh, if we break him as well, uh, shaken, leaders can automatically... Uh, try to rally themselves and then if he rallies himself you can actually try to rally that unit that's with them uh, you get a plus two bonus if you're in a hex that is blocking terrain I'm pretty sure it's blocking terrain it might be both degrading terrain and blocking terrain but you get a plus two to your check uh, and then you roll two d6, and you got to roll whatever your morale check is or lower. So in this case, a nine or less, the unit will rally, 
and we rolled a 10. So he has failed. Since he failed, then he can't uh, rally this guy either. So your, unit, your, uh, your leaders, you want to keep those units, um, you know, for activating multiple units, for giving their firepower to attacks, and also to rally your shaken men. And there are other units that can auto, uh, if we look at our, um, all of your uh, support weapons, like these guys here, if they're shaken, they uh, have SR, which means self rally. So these guys can try to self rally. We don't need a leader in with them. There is also one other thing we didn't talk about, which is kind of cool because it kind of separates, um, it kind of separates lock and load from other tactical games. You know, we have uh, the event markers we talked about, the alternating activations back and forth. And the other thing is when you're do when you do an attack and your attack is successful and they need to do a morale check, if they roll a one on their morale check, There we go. So if they roll a one on their morale check, right? Then what you do is uh, you roll again. And if you roll an even number, then a hero is created. Uh, let's see if we can grab us a hero here. So you can see that each side has a certain number of heroes. You can only ever have out two heroes at a time. So if you have two heroes, then um, you can't you can't uh, get another hero. So even if you roll one, then it doesn't matter because you already have your two heroes. So you only ever have uh, two heroes on each side. Uh, your your uh, weapon teams cannot create heroes. The only uh, Your single man counters can't create heroes. The, basically the only thing that can create your heroes are your, uh, your squads, either your half squads or your full squads. So again, when you're you know, I, Americans did an, a 10 attack on me, and I only had six defense, so 10 is higher than six, so it's a hit, so then I've got to make a morale check, and I roll the die, and I roll one. Oh, I rolled a one. Whoa, okay. Now we roll again. Boom. I rolled an even number, so I just created a hero. So that hero pops in. Uh, unfortunately, the unit, obviously, that rolled the one is probably going to be shaken, right? Because he's going to fail his check, probably. And, but you do create a, um, a hero out of it. So one of your guys steps up, and uh, while the rest of your men cower and, and become shaken, one of your men uh, have taken it upon themselves to be the hero for you know, the Americans or for the Germans, uh, they have one firepower by themselves. They can assault move. They can also, um, one of the stipulations on assault move is you can fire on the move or you can move them fire, but you cannot end your turn in an opponent's, I can move there and then fire, okay? Um, Heroes don't have that restriction. They can move, you know, I can move, the, I can move this guy up here, I can then fire, and then I can assault. So heroes, there's, uh, heroes are really good units, and number one, um, you know, they take, they, they take uh, your enemy, uh, um, you know, you can put a lot of pressure on your enemy, uh, they can assault move, like I said, and they can end their turn, uh, do an attack, uh, you know, being adjacent, you're going to get the double, uh, you're going to get a plus two for being adjacent, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then afterwards, assault. So a lot of times your heroes, what they do is they run around uh, and then they, um, uh, right, so they run around, they shoot, and then they ended up shaking the enemy and then they move in and then they melee. And then, of course, because no one's in there but a shaking unit, they get removed at the end of the turn. And so your heroes are running around causing all kinds of casualties. And it's great. It's great fun because it's not that hard to create a hero. 
and you can have several of them out there at a time and they can really change the swing of the momentum i mean the americans can be you know just killing it here and just moving forward but then all of a sudden you get a hero and he runs up he shoots a couple guys and they fail their check and then he walks into the hex and you know both both of these guys become uh, uh shaken and then our hero moves into the hex and then you know in the melee both the shaken units are removed and then all of a sudden the whole course of the battle has been changed uh which is pretty cool so i like that i like that uh always always having the slim chance of getting these heroes to come in and help you out it just and it always happens you know at the most opportune time when i'm playing against someone uh face to face i'm dominating them and i think oh man this is going to be a cakewalk and then all of a sudden they get a hero and they mess everything up and then i'm yelling and screaming how much i hate you heroes so all right, guys, I think that's going to be it for episode one in our lock and load system. If everyone uh, has any questions, um, let me know. And uh, if not, I think we covered quite a few. Co you know, I wanted to cover kind of the, the, the core basic rules, the multiple, you know, activating and how you activate. Um how the leaders how you can activate multiple with different leaders uh, movement uh, what else uh, how to attack uh, you know basic strategies and when to activate your units how to activate your units because that's kind of it's kind of part of the strategy is knowing where to put your units how to put your units, uh, which units to include in different hexes to get the most out of them, uh, you know, stuff like that. So I think uh, I was trying to follow along the rule book, but <laughs> I think I got sidetracked, but who knows? Anyways, it's been a lot of fun. I, um, yeah, I kind of actually stumbled upon lock and load. I haven't looked at it for a while, but uh, I kind of stumbled onto it by accident and I was like, wow there is a lot of stuff here now and it looks really really good i'm gonna have to pull my stuff out again and look at it so uh no questions for anyone but uh that's good there are a lot of things we haven't even talked about uh there are um there are rules which we, we haven't even looked at for uh weapon teams uh mortars um so mortars you know that's there's indirect fire and direct fire with mortars and how you do it slightly different um you know lots and lots and lots of vehicles uh which have <laughs> um let's see here if i flip this over can i flip it over to a table yeah so on the back of each ordinance uh, uh, armor or your uh, let's see here uh, what else would be a um, like this to a table yeah so any of your ordinances or AT guns, um, your mortars are different. They are slightly different. Your machine guns don't have tables like this, but the, on the back of the actual counters for tanks and anti-tank weapons and your, um, your ordinances, there's gonna be a, a, a special table that you use. Go to men. Took some of that melatonin yeah. to practice for the plane ride. Oh my god, my head's just like a spinning. <laughs> uh, so you have a little two hit table on the back of the counter and basically shows you, um, you know, the range and then your two hit numbers and then your penetration value or your, your damage number. We'll get to that later. Uh, I just wanted to 
you know, show you guys that there's a lot more to the game. We haven't even talked about, um, you know, just, uh, what else have we even talked about? There's medics, there's, um, all kinds of different units we haven't actually even looked at. Oh my gosh, there's a whole bunch. Flamethrowers, the bazookas. Each each of them are, you know, kind of slightly different. Um, uh, let's see, we talked about low crawl. Mm, what else have we... We're not going to talk about that. Uh, smoke. We've. I mentioned there's smoke in the game. Uh, we have to play a scenario that actually has that. Melee combat is actually. Of all the things in lock and load, melee combat is probably the most difficult. Because uh, it's. It kind of uses a different format than the regular system. So we'll have to talk about that at some point. Uh, <clears throat> what else? Uh, uh, yeah, the different phases of the game. We actually didn't talk about the different phases. There are three phases to the game. There's the rally phase, which happens very first, in the beginning of first turn. In that phase, that's when heroes try to rally their units. Uh, units can change uh, support weapons between one another in the same hex. You know, if uh, a lot of times, like when a hero is created, oh yeah, I'm going to give my hero this nice uh, uh, MG34. The reason you do that, oh yeah, we were talking about heroes. Uh, heroes never uh, half their firepower they always get full firepower as well so even if they're participating in an, a, um, a group attack they get their full firepower so if we had this situation um you know the the hero would get his full one we would use the uh um Yeah, let's see. Obviously, we wouldn't do that if, if this guy had a support weapon, but yeah. So, these guys run around with support weapons. They don't lose the penalty for being a single man counter. They get the full firepower. Their support weapons, normal, normal leaders only get half firepower. So, there's all kinds of cool rules with the hero. We just kind of covered them kind of quickly a little bit. Um, but if they are in a group and they do attack, they get their full firepower. So, in this situation... Come on, pop up. The 154 would be our lead unit. We'd get one firepower from them. Our hero would be assisting, but instead of getting half a firepower, we get a one full firepower from him. So uh, that can make a difference, actually. So uh, what else? Uh, yeah, I guess that's it for episode number one in our lock and load. We know we covered a lot. We're probably going to get a little bit more organized and talk about things specifically. In maybe some uh, some offline episodes where we're not just doing it, but I wanted to do it online because I figured a lot of people might be coming in or have questions or talk about it and uh, give me their thoughts or whatever. There's Molotov cocktails. There are um, this happens to just be as I mentioned the um, Normandy module. There are lots of different modules out there for lock and load. There's uh, East Front. Pacific, uh, Vietnam, modules, uh, modern day, Afghanistan. Uh, geez, I'm trying to think of all the different. Yeah, just go to Lock and Load Publishing because you'll see all of them there. Uh, www.lnlpublishing.com. Yeah, I think they've come a long ways. Uh, they're definitely trying to streamline everything and keep everything. You know, keep one set of rules so you can play any game in their system with the one set of rules, which I think is awesome. Awesome. So, yeah, I'm probably getting it offline. So, appreciate everyone's time tonight. Stratomatic Delaware, thanks. I, I digest your lots of inspiring to lose money on another game. 
not necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> I know, my friend. I I'm like, oh man, I'm looking at this stuff and it's like, wow, I got to get this stuff, man. There's so much good stuff. Uh, but we'll be doing some more episodes for you guys that are, you know, on the fence or not as familiar or just want to learn more before you dive into it. But uh, I think it's um, it's definitely getting better and better. And as they condense the rules and streamline them and make them a little more organized and everything, I think it plays very nice and it flows real nice as you can you know we'll see we're going to play a scenario we're going to play the uh the number one scenario uh they give you a couple tutorial scenarios in the rule book we'll play through a couple scenarios and you can see how things play it's not i mean once you do it i mean you just you start uh you know you start having to not look at charts, which obviously slows down the game. You just start learning things. Okay, well, if it's got a six morale, if I roll a one to a six, then it's not going to have any effect. If I roll a seven through an 11, he's going to be um, shaken. If I roll a 12 through a 17, which is going to be triple, then he's going to be casually reduced and shaken. You know, you kind of learn that. So, CB Cunningham, thanks for showing up. I do appreciate you guys spending a little bit of your evening with me tonight. I know it uh, went a little bit longer than I was planning, but we'll be doing some more episodes. We're going to be playing probably the, like I said, we're going to be playing the scenario, um, which is just mostly infantry and a couple support weapons, which is a good introduction. Uh, you don't need to get into all the other things right off the bat, but uh, CP Cunningham, would you sell out of ASL to get into lock and load? Um, I would not. I would not sell out of ASL to get into lock and load. And the reason I would tell you I would not do that, if I'm completely honest, is... Uh, I think lock and load is a great system and I think it's a has a tons and tons going for it. The only thing I don't think it has going for it is the amount of people that play it or the amount of people that um, And I could be totally wrong because, like I said, it's been a while since I actually played it. I think, I think there's a lot more people that know about ASL and a lot more people that play ASL than they play lock and load. <clears throat> so if I was to take, <clears throat> you know, my lock and load stuff to a game convention to hook up with some people, there might be a few people that play. But uh, I would, if I took my ASL thing, I would think there would be a lot more people to play ASL. Um, if I was just going to do it for myself at home and not worry about having to go and play with other people and I was just going to solo things at my house. Uh, I would say in that case, yes. I would sell out of ASL to get lock and load. And the reason I will tell you why. Um, I think this plays better solo than ASL uh, for the first reason. And the second reason is because ASL is so complicated and complex, it kind of gets in the way of actually enjoying the game especially when you're doing solo. I mean, the best thing about ASL is playing with someone and talking, conversing, and teasing them about, oh, I'm going to wipe out your guys, and oh my god, I can't believe I just broke all your dudes, you know, stuff like that. If I'm playing that solo, then I don't get that enjoyment of playing with someone. I think lock and load, because it's simpler, it's faster, and it's easier, I would sell out of ASL and buy lock and load. I would do it if you're going to be a solo player, by yourself, or even maybe if you're going to just do, um, 
you know, solo scenarios, or even if you decide, you know, oh, I'll get online and play with a friend that you might know that plays this in on Vassal, um, yes, I would definitely, because I think this plays better solo. I think ASL, you have the whole concealment problem where if you're playing solo, you got the concealment counters, but you know it's there. You know, ninety percent of the encounters in ASL are going to have concealment counters, right? So that's ninety percent of the scenarios. As a solo player, you're going to know what's okay. These are dummy stacks. These are not dummy stacks. Uh, and lastly, lastly, I will bring this up. And um, if you go to www.lockandloadpublishing.com part of the new 5th edition to their tactical rule set, they actually have a solo module now. So any of the game systems, you buy the solo module and you have a bunch of cards and stuff that come and basically the cards dictate what the enemy does. So you play like one side and then the computer plays the other side, but instead of you know the computer, you're using cards and 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 dice and stuff to help do the solo. So there's a solo a rule set for the tactical as well. So that's another thing. Um, yeah. So I guess that's kind of my opinions on that. Uh, I can get my face-to-face -face players into this easier than ASL. Absolutely. I could. I I could get out of a hundred people that might be gamers. You might be able to convince twenty-five of them to play war games, and of those twenty-five, I could get twenty of them to play this, and only five of them to play ASL. So maybe five out of every hundred people are going to play ASL. I would say twenty out of every hundred people would play uh, an easy an easier system like this. Oh, you just throw a six-sided dice. How hard is that? You know, you move a couple units around. Uh, occasionally, you flip them over to the shaking side. You move your leader over to try and heal them, you know, to rally them. It's so much simpler than trying to explain ASL. So, absolutely. All right, guys. Jim, uh, Stratomatic Delaware, CP Cunningham, Al Red Sox fan, Viper Dave, uh, who else showed up tonight? I turned hobbyist man. I'm sorry, I didn't even see you in the chat there earlier. Good to see this game getting some love, says I turned hobbyist. Thank you, sir. Sorry, I didn't uh, announce your arrival. I didn't see you there. Uh, Pokey Trey was here as well. Uzi Patrol was here. Boy, we had a lot of great, great uh, players. So I'll be doing it again probably uh, this weekend. I'll probably put out. I don't know if I want to do any more tutorials or we just want to just start playing this scenario and then learn as we as we progress. Uh, I don't know the way I want to do it yet, but we'll be looking at it. Um, so Uzi Patrol says game looks awesome. So yeah, appreciate you guys showing up. Uh, leave your thoughts and comments here on the YouTube if you have anything for me. Uh, and we'll, we'll be on this weekend. Uh, playing, uh, playing the intro scenario so you guys can see at least how things flow. I mean, when you're throwing out example after example after example, you don't really see the flow and how easy things go. But after you after you see a turn or two, you, I, I can almost guarantee everybody that's in the chat is going to be like, oh, yeah, this game is pretty damn easy. But it's just understanding all the things that we talked about tonight with the alternating activations and you know, all that, that once you understand all that stuff and you see it, it's like, oh, yeah, okay. Ah, I understand. All right, guys, thanks so much. I appreciate every one of you, and uh, we'll see you guys soon. Until then, take care of yourselves, and we'll see you uh, probably tomorrow for some more Lock and Load. Thanks for watching, guys.